unidentifiable flying object. The UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 107 of UFO No. Your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians. Time to get elevated and speculate about Travis Walton. That's right, Travis Walton. I bring this one up a lot. A lot. And the reason why is, to me, it is one of the most compelling cases I've seen and looked at. Mostly because of a couple things. The reactions of everyone involved seems genuine. Travis Walton hasn't changed his story. In fact, he has changed his perspective on his original encounter, which, to me... You know, retrospective looking at your situation and always unpacking it and trying to decipher what that means as opposed to a rehearsed story will come with different reflection as time goes. You you see what I'm saying with this? The more you dwell on it and, and, and think about it, the more your mind changes about what really happened then. And that's real. That's real. Whereas, to me, a lot of cases are just straight up rehearsed. The details are identical every single time. Nothing changes. Nothing changes from that first interview to that second interview, or the last interview. But in this case, when you talk talk to, when you have listened to an interview from Walton now versus then, his perspective on the encounter have changed. Very, very interesting. And, you know, you have the murder case, the the accusation of murder to the people that were reported this. Um, So you have this real reaction by authorities, by press, by the people, real reactions, real searches, which does happen in a lot of other cases, real searches when people disappear even if they claim to have been abducted by aliens. But the whole case is fascinating to me. And I wasn't as sold on it. And I, you know, i not the biggest fan of giving Jogan credit. Because sometimes he just annoys me. But uh, he does have some phenomenal interviews on there. Uh, and one of them is with Travis Walton. And the interview they do is a little bit flighty here and there. Travis seems to be, in my opinion, nervous. So he's he's all over the place. Doesn't make eye contact. There's there's a lot of things to pick on there. And some of the things he says towards the end of the interview get a little, in my opinion, a little out there. It's all a little out there, really, if you think about it. But his to me, is very compelling. So we're going to get into it, and uh, we're going to go through it. But I want to thank you all for joining the show. I'm in the stratosphere, baby. Cruising around 118,000 feet, and it's clear skies. If you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review everywhere you can. That's Apple iTunes, Spotify. Uh, If you, you can listen to us on Audible, they have reviews pretty much everywhere now where you listen to podcasts and where we're at, you can leave a review. So please do. Thank you. And no matter where you're listening slash watching, whether it's YouTube, Rumble, make sure and hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and uh, that way you don't miss out on any episodes coming down the pike. Click that link in the show notes, the portal to all things UFO know to find merch, where to listen, where to watch, and you can join the growing list of tinfoilists 
the tinfoil militia, these badasses where you get no ads, all my loyalty, bonus episodes each and every single week. And every single episode, every episode is brought to you by the Tinfoil Militia members who support this podcast. And they are Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter, designer, Tinfoil hat wearing Aaron Rice, Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, Nathan Boldly Gone Higby, who, by the way, is not with us right now. He is out in the field. We were having some audio issues. He's out in the field collecting clues as to where Blind Mike has been taken. So, he's out there trying to find out. He's on the trail. So, he's going to be giving us updates here and there, taking a break from the show, but we'll have him back eventually in glorious fashion. So, anyways, once again, I want to thank you all for joining the show. I appreciate you all. Let's get into it. Travis Walton. So, this takes place 1975. Travis is 22 years old at the time. There have been numerous books about this. A movie, Fire in the Sky. Uh, If you haven't seen the movie, you got to see the movie, Fire in the Sky. It is great. Uh, D.B. Sweeney, I think, is the guy who plays Travis. And uh, uh, what's the guy's name who plays the T-2000 in in, uh, the Terminator movie, T-2? I can't remember what his name is. Robert something. Plant? Plant? I I keep going. Robert Palmer? No, I keep going musicians. I'm pretty sure I'm thinking of musicians. Anyways, because I keep wanting to go Robert Plant. No. Roger Waters? No. So the Fire in the Sky movie... Does a great job. Obviously, Hollywood, they get some things wrong. They embellish a little bit. But when you listen to Travis talk about it, once again, that 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 Jogan interview is really, really well done. But the basic story from the movie is the same. Most of the time, as you know, I am skeptical of cases where people have been paid People make money from their story, right? Well, Walton is one of them. The movie made money. The book made money. But like I pointed out, there's things that are different about this case. The reactions of everyone involved is so, to me, so natural that it's hard to lie about things like that. And the turn of events that took place from them reporting, being investigated for murder, how the police didn't originally think that it was murder, but eventually started to believe that due to the length of time that Travis was was missing for. Uh, but there's some other things we're going to point out that do, as every case, make it murky. So let's start digging through. The circumstances of the event are interesting because it's a lot of times, this is one of the other things that makes me uh, believe this. In almost every case, it is the main witness, the abductee, the, the, the experiencer who comes forward talking about what they experienced with little to no testimony from anybody else. But this, this case is so unique in the way that you had six guys, six guys, real men who are loggers, I would imagine don't scare easy, at least not in the traditional sense, you know what I mean? That, end up legitimately reporting this incident uh, as opposed to Travis. And he is legitimately missing for a significant amount of time and then does come back pretty fucked up. Not as far as physically goes, but catatonic um, in a lot of cases. So anyways. Also, the other thing is that it was immediately after this took place 
immediately the same night that Travis went missing, it was reported, and the investigation began for the five days that he was gone. As opposed to 20 years later, in a lot of cases, where people come forward going, I had locked memories, and oh, I couldn't remember, but now it's spectacular fashion, I can remember everything. Mm Mm-hmm. So that is the other thing that makes it very believable. So a lot of these pieces put it together to make it a very convincing case. And then, like I said, on top of that, these guys are accused of murder while their friend is legit missing. And then he just pops up out of nowhere. Uh, So. Here's the story. November 5th. 1975, little after 6 p.m. after working in the Apache Sitgreaves region of the U.S. National Forest, seven woodcutters, Travis Walton, Kevin P- or Ken Peterson, I'm sorry, John Goulet, Steve Pierce, Alan Dallas, and Dwayne Smith were, Smith, sorry, were making their way to Snowflake, Arizona, in the foreman Michael Rogers pickup. Uh, That was the seventh Rogers, by the way. Uh, Noticed a strange glow coming from the woods. So at first, they think it's a possible forest fire. And so they're on alert because I don't know if you've ever been involved in forest fires or anything like that, but I've had family members, not, not myself, but I've had family and whatnot that have had to be escorted out. And the big thing is, is that you can get trapped without a way to get out because the roads will be, you know, surrounded by fire. You might not be able to get out. In a lot of these cases, you're, you're talking about a one road area. There's, there aren't multiple routes you can take. There's one road out. So anyway, so they didn't want to get trapped. So as they approach the hill in the road where the light was actually coming from, they see a large silver disc hovering in a clearing by the road glowing, really bright, lighting up everything. The way Travis talks about it is it was like a gold, a golden glow coming from the craft itself. The large silver disc part, that's what varies from time to time because it seems to be in certain points the craft is glowing and at other points it's not. So I'm not really sure. Anyways, so... He described it as glowing a golden color that that just was kind of eerie and it was it it surrounded everything. It covered everything. So kind of in shock at what he was seeing, Rogers brings the truck to a stop. And as he does, without warning, Walton jumps out of the truck, the passenger side, he's in the front passenger jumps out of the front passenger side and walks towards the craft. Kind of almost running in what what Travis says because in Travis's words from the interview, he says, uh, I didn't think it was going to stay there. I thought it was going to take off. So he wanted to get as close to it as he could before it took off, but it didn't take off. So he jumps out of the, the truck goes to the glowing craft. The whole crew is yelling at him to get back in the truck. He continues, Walton does, until he's standing really close to this thing, craft. He starts hearing, and there's some, you know, like in the interview, there's some back and forth about how he like got behind a log, but then he was like, you know, the distance he may have been away, 10 feet or so, somewhere around there. But it's a little bit confusing as far as uh, exactly how far he was away from the craft. Um, so I just imagine, like a lot of forest clearings are, there's probably a fallen log over here. There's a clearing, you know, on the right-hand side. And then over on the left-hand side is a big clearing, and then there's wood surrounding it. And so he's just running over to it, but when it doesn't disappear... Now he's close to it, and it's making noise. Now it starts making noise, this mechanical turbine 
noise, like a like a, a humming. And the way Travis describes it is, it you could feel it more than you uh, more than you could hear it. You could feel it. So that says to me like low, deep rumbling tones, right? The, the kind of bass that you feel in your chest. You know what I mean? That's what it makes me think of. And then the craft started to move like wobble, but still hovering. So this is when he steps back, starts to back away, uh, and at one point either gets behind a log, like ducked down, or just is on the other side of a log. I'm not really sure. Based on the interview, I couldn't really tell if he was crouched down or if he was still standing up. I think he was crouched down at this point behind a log when he kind of stepped back away from it, but he was still pretty close. And according to the crew inside the truck, when they were yelling at him to get back in the truck, Walton finally decides, okay, I'm going to, and stands up. And as he describes in the the interview, at this point is when he's the closest to the craft because now he's standing up, exposed, in front of the craft. And this is when the crew describes a blue-green beam reach out and hit Walton square in the chest, launching him a foot into the air, arms and legs outstretched, shooting him back 10 feet like he'd been touched by a live wire is the way to describe it. What's And look, anybody who would judge these men who... This is what happened. As soon as they think he's dead, they take off. Anybody who would judge these men for what they did as far as, wow, these cowards or whatever, even though we would all love to say and think that we wouldn't do that, that we would stay and jump out and run over and grab him and bring him back to the truck, chances are, They've never been through this, right? That's the idea. They've never they've never had an experience like this in their lives. You have no no comprehension. Nowhere in your life have you ever thought You know, we've all had that thought. What do you do if someone breaks in your house? What would I do? What would I do if I'm if I'm you know, if I'm crossing the street and I think a car's about to hit me? We've all kind of had these thoughts, or at least I have. As far as like, well, what would I do in that situation? Oh, I'm going to try and jump or I'm going to try and do this. I don't know. I have. I'm paranoid. But I, I think about these things like, well, what am I going to do if this happens? So that way I, I kind of feel somewhat prepared, right? Well, in what world are you going to be like, man, if a UFO ever comes down and my buddy jumps out and tries to go over and meet it and gets hit by a laser... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure and jump out and go grab them. Okay, so I don't think they've ever had that inner monologue with themselves. So it's hard for me to judge these men for what how they reacted. I would like to say I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't take off and run, but they did. They just sped off, boom, take off. But they're already in the truck. It's not a hard thing for his foot to just go down on the gas. It's a very quick reaction. So it's not like it took a bunch of moves for them to do this. It just was a very quick reaction of a stiff leg. So that that's very natural reaction. No one's sure what happened during this time because keep in mind, Walton is unconscious, as far as they know, dead. But we know better. But they think he's dead. But we know at least he's unconscious. They're away from the scene. So they're not seeing the craft. They're not seeing Walton. They're not seeing anything. So because of this, no one knows what happened if these creature, if the, something, somebody came out of the craft and collected him, if he was scooped up by a tractor beam, if he was, nobody knows. I was thinking of another one, then I couldn't think of it. Nobody, nobody knows what happened. But either way, they get a little ways down and... The foreman Rogers decides, nope, we're going back. And they all like, okay, go back. So they go back and Walton's gone. 
the craft is gone. Now think about, it doesn't say like how far down the road they got. In the movie, it shows that they just took off. It doesn't show that they went back at all. In fact, the very beginning of the movie just shows a truck running down the road. It doesn't show like anything what actually happened. It's it's a flashback. But they definitely went back. That's according to them. That's according to, well, them. You know, it's interesting because now that I think about it, since Walton was gone, and only the guys, it makes me wonder if if they maybe they did go back, maybe they didn't. Because who knows, right? Maybe they just said that because they didn't want to look like cowards. Either way, that's pure speculation because, according to them, they went back to retrieve their friend, but... He was gone. So was the craft. So that's when they go ahead and um, they start freaking out at this point. <laughs> he's gone. I mean, they were freaked out before. But now that he's gone, panic sets in. So they drive to a shopping center. Now, what's interesting, in the movie, it's a restaurant. Again, Hollywood, whatever. I don't know why it made a difference to them that it was a restaurant versus a shopping center. Because to me, w- wouldn't you want to be accurate with it? So why change it to a restaurant? How does that help production instead of a instead of a shopping center? Couldn't you find a shopping center? Anyways. Uh, they go to a shopping center in the nearby town of Heber or Heber. Uh, I think it's Heber. And the exact time frame varies a little bit. But sometime between 7.30 and 8 is when Ken Peterson calls the local police. So this is an hour and a half, two hours after the incident, supposedly. Um, Ken Peterson calls the local police, uh, getting in touch with Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison, that one of their crew has gone missing. And Ellison goes out to meet him. When he shows up, the men are all visibly distressed. Some of them pretty close to tears. Travis goes into this weird tangent about how one guy was pissed about how they they said that he cried. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, first, for one, I don't, as Travis, I'm not Travis, but as somebody who's trying to relay a story, I don't see how that helps or anything. I don't see how it helps anything to add depth to anything, clarify anything. It do, it doesn't clarify anything. That, you know, oh, he was upset that uh, we said that he was crying. So I would have left that out if it were me. But at the same time, if he's all about truth, all about transparency, then it's all about oversharing, right? So that's that was definitely an overshare. Uh, anyways. Some of them close to tears, so Ellison is shocked by what they tell him. He's stunned. Speechless, uh, quiet for a moment, thinking there's no way they're telling the truth. But later on, he stated if they were acting, they were awfully good at it. And I'm sure, you know, as a cop, They see a lot of, uh, you know, what is it, false honesty, you know, like trying to fake being honest, trying to fake being a good person. That's what, you know, a lot of criminals do. I, you know, look, I did that when I tried to get out of trouble, be like, play it off. Things like that. That's what you do. So anyways, they can see through a lot of that. So he isn't sure what to think. Not sure what to do now. So he contacts uh, the other sheriff, Sheriff Gillespie, his superior. And Gillespie tells him to have the guys remain there under supervision until he gets there. So around 9 p.m., Gillespie, along with police officer Ken Copeland, show up at the shopping mall, and the six men are starting to get really nervous. Because now there's 
two sheriffs there. There's a, another cop there. Um, time, I mean, now it's going on three hours since he went, since he disappeared. And Rogers demands, after everybody shows up and continues to question him, Rogers demands that they go back to the scene and search immediately while the other crew members go and inform family and friends. So, being nighttime without any police search dogs, several officers, along with Rogers, Peterson, and Dallas, search the area. No sign of Walton or any sign of anything else that they were describing. You know, a craft, any signs of a landing anywhere, nothing. So, as the night wore on, they just aren't finding anything. No signs of anything, no clues, nothing. So they decide to delay the search till morning, but everyone's really concerned. Mind you, keep in mind this is November. So everyone's really concerned that Walton, who's only in jeans and a shirt and a light jacket, would die from the conditions, the environment. So remember, the other uh, two guys went with, who was it? It was... Um, It doesn't say who is it. Roger Manithus. Anyways, um, the other guys go and tell the family. And they end up telling Walton's brother, Dwayne, who lived in Glendale, about three hours away, who ended up driving down. And they tell his sister. He had a sister named, what was it, Grant? I think is her name. Tells her, notifies his mom all the family, friends, all that. The next day, November 6th, they go out, search the area again. This time, they got more people. But again, no sign of Walton. Police start to suspect that the UFO story is actually a cover-up for some kind of an accident, potentially homicide. So after a few days, news gets out to the reporters from the tabloids, and newspapers along with UFO investigators. And one of these UFO investigators is Fred Sylvanus from Phoenix, who ended up uh, interviewing Michael Rogers and um, Walton's brother, Dwayne. They mostly use this moment, this interview, to criticize the police, uh, that is, Dwayne and Michael, Instead of explaining, which I understand their frustration, but instead of explaining the situation and the incident that occurred, they spent most of the time criticizing the police for not making more of an effort to find Travis because they were thinking there was foul play at foot. But one of the things that Rogers had mentioned, and I'll get into more detail about this a little bit later, but he had said that he wouldn't be able to fulfill his logging contract because of this happening. You know, Travis going missing. They had a time frame, a deadline that they had to meet for this logging contract and that they wouldn't be able to get it done. And that led some people to believe that the incident was potentially staged to get an extension on this contract. But again, I'll go into that a little bit later. So Dwayne tells Fred, the UFO investigator, that along with his brother, Travis, they believed in UFOs and that he had seen a UFO himself 12 years previously and even made a pact to get as close as possible if either of them saw one. So that's the reason why Travis jumped out of the truck and tried to get as close to as possible. He told his brother, if we ever see one, that's what we'll do. This, again, got used against them a lot. So the interview that Rogers gave, criticizing the police and about the logging contract was used against them. The fact that Travis and Dwayne were UFO believers, that got used against them a lot. And from a skeptic's perspective, I absolutely 100% agree. That is suspicious because 
as I've pointed out in the past, it makes you want something to happen. So you, you know, the potential for you of conjuring something, the brain is powerful. Hallucinations occur. There's all kinds of drugs pumping in your body. We know this. We know that there are incidents of people in all kinds of situations of seeing things they didn't see. Having things happen to them that didn't really, I mean, it physically manifested itself, but it was from something that the, the greatest one I, I've talked about is the guy that uh, was in a drug trial that had an overdose reaction told that wasn't told that he was on the, the placebo side of it, but had an overdose and then was told in the emergency room, oh, you have a sugar pill and then snapped right out of it. The power of the brain because he believed he was having an overdose. So, again, that's what makes it skeptical. And, and like I said, I totally agree with that. It shows personal bias. You want to have an experience, so you're going to have an experience. And, again, possible motive to create a scenario. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is he was really missing. And the rest of the guys, the rest of the crew, the only guys that were there, not Dwayne, didn't have a pact to make contact with UFOs or necessarily even believe in them. Plus, they were begging Travis to get away from it. Panicked when he was hit. All natural reactions, like I talked about. And there's six of them that all saw the same thing. All right, now let's look at the logging contract angle because this is interesting. And this is something that never gets brought up. Never gets brought up. And it is interesting. I'm not saying it doesn't make it true or that it's enough, but it is interesting. So the timber thinning contract that Michael Rogers had with the U.S. Service, uh, Forest Service meant that they were responsible for thinning over 1,200 acres in the Apache Sitgreaves Forest. Rogers had significantly undercut the bids by other companies because he had a small crew, which put a lot of pressure on them to do a lot of work in a small amount of time uh, compared to a larger company. But by the summer, it was obvious it was not, they were not going to meet the deadline. So he already had an extension going on this contract, meaning that at this point, if he failed, he would get fined. Not only would he get fined, but he would forfeit a dollar per acre for all work carried out. Now, remember, it's over 1,200 acres, so that's over 1,200 bucks, and this is 1975. That's a decent amount of money now. That's a big amount of money then, especially for these, you know, small-time logging crews. So that's all motive. If we're looking at it as a, as a murder case, right, that's motive. The deadline was November 10th. It was now the 6th. And another extension meant more fines, meaning he couldn't pay the crew, let alone all the expenses, and... Winter is coming. Winter is coming. So, all of that adds up to motive, for sure. But all these other things make it very compelling. So anyways, so a lot of skeptics bring up the fact that he could have staged an event to have their contract voided and receive payment in full due to circumstances beyond their control. But there have been interviews with Forest Service people about these contracts where they have been asked this question, not to Travis, not to other people, but to 
um, from investigators to the Forest Service people. And they've all said the same thing, which is he wouldn't gain much. It, that's a lot to go through simply to get another extension or to just make the money, which would be, you know, not, I mean, not a huge amount of money compared to, I, I don't know. I, it just, the way they made it out is they made it out that it would be a lot of work to go through to stage an event for such a little payout as to just fulfill, not have to fulfill the contract, you know? So it didn't seem as big of a motive as it might appear. But who knows? People do things for crazy reasons. But anyways, those are all, those are some of the reasons why it's, it still remains very murky is these types of things. So anyways. As the days go on, we're talking about five days here. Several unsuccessful searches. The suspicions of murder against the crew members was very real. Very, very real. And between time and the elements, police started to discreetly change from a search and rescue to a recovery of the body. And after the second full day of searching, the police offered them, the guys, to take a lie detector test. At first, they were adamant that they would take any test of any kind to prove that they were truthful. And so polygraph examiner Cy Gilson apparently did these tests and all the crew members pass, no problems, aside from Alan Dallas, who didn't fail the test, but the results were inconclusive. And the reason why is because it was no, or this is what they say, is that it was known that Dallas didn't get along with Walton. In fact, in the interview with Jogan, he talks about how he had gotten in a fight with Dallas the morning before this happened over his girlfriend. So that put Dallas under a lot of pressure because now he's, he's the, Results are inconclusive. He's got a fight with Walton before he disappears. But he's also got all the guys that have, they've all been together the entire time. So there was no point when Dallas and Walton were technically like by themselves where Dallas could have, especially after he gets hit, they see Walton there then all take off and then go back and he's gone. There's no point where Dallas is by himself where he could have done any of that. (coughs) Excuse me. And why not just give up Dallas if it was really that Dallas had done something to him? Why would the other guys claim this whole big scenario instead of just give up Dallas? So anyways. But despite the efforts of the crew members, the lie detector tests, all this, the police singled him out as being responsible for Walton's death, even without a body. So they're starting to put together the murder case against Dallas. And just after midnight, November 10th, Walton's sister, Grant, got a phone call from Travis. He sounded confused, panicked, disoriented, and he was at an Exxon station somewhere nearby. So Grant's husband, uh, they don't have a name for him for some reason. Apparently he's not important enough to have a name. We're going to call him Doug. Grant's husband, Doug, and Walton's brother, Dwayne, jump in their vehicle and head towards Heber, which is... I'm not really sure. I can't remember 
if Walton Travis says that he's able to describe to them where he is, I can't remember, or if they just knew where the nearest gas station was, and in the movie, they're just driving around looking for him, and they pass a gas station, and he's there. Um, and maybe there was a small amount of pay phones, so they just knew where one would be. I, I'm not really sure exactly how they knew where he was. So it could be any one of those. Travis described where he was, so that's how he got they got there. Or there was a limited amount of pay phones in the area, so that's how they knew where he was. Or something like that. Uh, so anyways. In the book, there's a book, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, The Walton Experience. That's kind of where the movie came from and all that. It's the first really publication of Travis's experience. He talks about his first memories after waking up following his disappearance. He says he regained consciousness lying on his stomach. The air was cold. He was instantly awake in the interview with Jogan. He said he could feel the cold seeping in through his clothes. He noticed a bright light on the bottom of a curved, gleaming hull, the mirrored outline of a silvery disc around 40 feet long, hovering somewhere over him. Then the object shot vertically into the sky and was gone. After taking Walton to his mom's house, his brother Dwayne took him to a hospital in Phoenix. And... At first, everyone was resistant. All the family was resistant, apparently. Or maybe it was just the guys. It might have been just the crew that was uh, uh, resistant to allow APRO, which is the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, to take the case. Here's why I say it, it was maybe the crew, because it, you know, there's, there's, Dwayne believed in UFOs. Travis believed in UFOs. There's people that say, that know the family, that say the whole family believed in UFOs. So if that's the case, I can't imagine that they would be opposed to a UFO research group investigating the case. But that's what the reports say, that after initial resistance, they let him. So I'm thinking it was the crew. Because they're the ones with the experience, you know what I mean? So anyways, APRO takes the case. And they immediately examine uh, Walton using two different uh, physicians. So here's what his... Uh, uh, and what they find is no physical injuries. No physical injuries. His brain is scrambled. Memory is shot. He's catatonic in some cases. But no physical injuries. According to Walton, this is when they started talking to him about his experience. According to him, the last thing he clearly remembered was being hit by this beam of light. And then the next thing he knew, he was on a flat surface like a reclining bed. And he noticed the air was heavy and damp. He also had pain all over his body. And there was a light shining on him above, from above. And as he describes, each breath was difficult and painful. At first, he thought he was in a hospital somewhere. Then he, he notices three figures standing around him, each wearing an orange jumpsuit. The jumpsuit thing always stands out to me because what do astronauts wear? Jumpsuits. Like if you go and you look at pilots, you go and you look at astronauts, they're all wearing flight suits. Jumpsuits, right? Sometimes blue. 
sometimes not oranges, generally like uh, prison. So maybe these were prison inmates. But anyways, I, my first thinking is future humans. But that's me. It's not my experience. Anyways, let's continue on. I'll get into a little bit more. So, they're all wearing orange jumpsuits, and it was obvious to him that they were not human. They were about five feet high, big bald heads, and round eyes. Big round eyes. And as he describes now, a pretty typical alien. And he gets a surge of adrenaline. He's panicky. Walton jumps down from the table, starts shouting at these creatures, warning them to stay away. He reaches back, picks up a glass-type-like cylinder from a shelf, and is swinging around at these three creatures. They end up backing away, leave the room. And what's interesting is... You, when you look at the book and you you listen to some of the interviews later on, the one thing that changes a little bit is the description of what happened after he left the initial room. So in the interview with Jogan, he says that the aliens leave the room and in comes a taller long-haired figure, humanoid, human, basically. As Travis says, he seemed familiar, you know, like as in human familiar, but wearing a, a glass helmet that leads him out of the craft. However, in the book, and maybe this because... Eh, I think a lot of this is due to the hypnotic regression. That I think maybe later on, because he doesn't talk about this as much now, that maybe he believes he was misled or something. I'm not sure. But it's interesting that he leaves these details out in a lot of his later accounts as opposed to now. And I, the reason why I still believe it is because most people embellish Later on, they add things later on as opposed to leaving things out that are more detailed. So here's some of the details he left out that are actually in the book. He goes down a hallway and finds himself in a round room with a strange chair in the middle of the room. He goes over the chair and as he's moving around the room, before he gets to the chair, lights are coming on all around him. He goes and he sits in the chair, and when he does, lights come on all around the room, reminding Walton of what he describes as a planetarium ceiling. Right? He didn't say any of that in Jogan. I, I've seen a bunch of interviews with him. He didn't say any of that. But it's in the book, and so it's fascinating and it's also not in the movie. So it's fascinating that I wonder, it makes me wonder if he realized later on that that didn't happen or something. So anyways, continues on. The left-hand arm of the chair had a single short thick lever with an oddly molded handle. I don't know what that means, oddly molded. Uh, I don't know if it was shaped like a dick. I don't know. On the other arm was a lime green screen putting out a warm glow. So if you can imagine, handle on one side, screen on another, like a pilot chair. Walton pushed on the lever and the lights rotated, the lights of the planetarium ceiling rotated until he let go of it, stopping in their new position. Realizing he had no idea what he was doing or what any of these buttons or levers did, he got out of the chair. And as he did, all the lights went out. Isn't that an interesting detail that you would think he would have brought up with Jogan? 
That's what I found it, found interesting, that not all the details that are in his book made it on to Jogan. And that's why I think maybe he was nervous or he's thought about it long enough to realize that some of these things may have been his own brain's embellishments or possibly fuckery by the hypnotic regressionists. So I'm not really sure. So either way, he gets out of the chair and uh, hears a noise behind him and spins around and sees this tall humanoid. This is where the, the tall humanoid comes in now. So it's interesting that little small part didn't make it into Jogan or the movie, but it's in the book. Interesting. Not sure why. So anyways, sees a tall humanoid figure with glassy helmet, blue coveralls. Starts firing questions at him. You know, why am I here? What do you want from me? Things like that. But either he didn't hear him or ignore him. Either way, the humanoid man motions him to follow him. So Travis follows the tall figure down another hallway. And again, this, this is another detail that didn't make it into Jogan, didn't make it into the movie, but made it, but it's in the book. Goes down a steep ramp into another larger room, similar to an aircraft carrier. And he sees two other discs landed in the hangar in front of him. Right? That's not in Jogan. That's not in the movie. Why not? Why not? Why? I question everything. Why that? Why, why not those two things? The two things that make you believe it's a craft instead of just some room, right? Those two things. Otherwise, you, you don't really know, like as in the interview with Jogan, Jogan asks him, so were you in the craft? Do you know where you were? Were you in the craft that they zapped you from? And even he says, I'm not really sure. Right? So isn't that weird? I find that very odd. And I don't know if it's because he was nervous or if there, if he's intentionally keeping something out. I'm not sure why, but I find that intriguing. So he's led into another room where he claims to see three humans, two men and a woman. No helmets, but large eyes. He starts to ask them questions. But like the other humanoid guy, Neither one, they either didn't hear him or they're ignoring him. So they direct him to another table-like object, motioning that he should sit down. And the female approaches him with a mask-like device, puts it on his face, which this is something that Travis mentioned, but I don't believe he mentioned any of the other bits. I think he had mentioned that it was the first humanoid that puts the mask on him. Or maybe doesn't put a mask on him. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure he put a, put a mask on, but it didn't have any wires connected to it, is the way he describes. Puts the mask on his face, and a second later, he's out. So then Travis claims that uh, he wakes up. Next thing he wakes up, he's on his stomach outside the gas station. Then, still confused, Travis goes to the payphone. And in his mind, he believed he'd only been missing for a, a few hours. It wasn't until his brother got there and told him that he'd been gone for five days that he realized. There were th theories that circulated after he reappeared that he may have been attacked and drugged instead of abducted, abducted by aliens that he was attacked and drugged and woke up in an unknown hospital and due to his general confusion made him believe his surroundings were this spaceship or whatever. But there were no signs of him being attacked. Again, no physical injuries. No drugs in his system. After a couple of days, Travis and his brother 
Dwayne, they had a meeting with ARPO. Remember the research, uh, the uh, ufology group? With their consultant, James Harder, to give a statement. And in order to unlock other memories of what happened, Walton agreed to go under hypnotic regression. And that's where I bring up that maybe these memories of the ship, the saucer, the three other humans were all... Because those, in my opinion, those are the only things that... Details that become similar to other experiences. Everything else, to me, is so unique. I mean, obviously, the abduction, waking up on a table, those things are relatively similar but everything else how he how he first got hit the people that were involved his missing time the 5 days uh the fact that he came back dehydrated and malnourished and all these things uh that's what is so unique to everything else. And so then you have after hypnotic regression, I believe is when these ideas of the hangar with the other crafts, everything that tied it into being a spaceship. You see what I'm saying? Otherwise, what is it? It's just a room. It's just a room with a table with three beings and and another being. That would be four beings. (laughs) Anyways, but... That's all it is. It doesn't say spaceship. It doesn't scream alien. Nothing. Until you have the hangar with the spaceships, the, you know, the other being, uh, potentially other beings. You know what I'm saying? So, to me, this is where it could potentially muck things up even more. What's interesting, though, is that Travis, his conscious memory and his unconscious memory were the same. So a lot of times, you know, that's why I don't believe the unlocked memory thing in this case. Because they were the same. He didn't have locked memories. He just had this memory. But they say that because they could only he could only remember the 2 hour period after the beam hit him that everything else felt off limits to him that there was a mental block of some kind that was preventing access to these memories so let's go over some of the actual evidence that supports this as a real case. Um, He had full five days worth of beard growth. He was significantly malnourished and dehydrated. But what's very interesting is the fact that he had elevated levels of electrolytes in the blood which would normally be the case if he had uh, literally starved for a long time. He would have had elevated levels of electrolytes, but he didn't. So if he had been starved, malnourished, like dehydrated completely for that full five days, so that means what they're saying is it would seem that whoever or whatever took Walton and wherever they took him, they gave him the appropriate fluids to prevent any long-term damage during that time. That is confirmed. So that is very, very, very interesting. But again to me, does not scream aliens. I mean, our medical industry does that. So anybody with medical knowledge could do that. Now, it's claimed 
you know, after the fact, of course, it's claimed that there were other sightings on November 10th, uh, suggesting that there was a craft that dropped him off, right? Several hours before Travis was returned. So again, kind of leading to the idea that, that these witnesses saw the craft that later dropped Travis off. But here are the examples. An unknown witness from an unknown location reported seeing a V formation of orange lights over her house, waited to see if the lights would return, then blacked out. Her next memory was sitting in a large chair in a strange room with dim lights all around her, seeing several human figures walking back and forth through a doorway. The next she knew she was back in her home, things like that. Coat tail riding whores. That's what they are. Coat tail riding whores. Murky in the waters even more. But then here's this. Reports from Minnow Air Force Base in North Dakota about a bright star-like object the size of a car moving across the side. Uh, the sky, about 1,000 to 2,000 feet high, no noise. But where's North Dakota from Arizona? About 1,500 miles away. Now, we've talked before about how, you know, if time travel and, and, you know, space travel, you know, the fact that you can just fold space and time, you could, you know, distance doesn't mean anything. But it's 1,500 miles away. And they're trying to tie this together. And then a few sightings from Canada over 1,800 miles away. They're trying to tie this together. I'm not buying that. Uh, Several years after the encounter, in 1978, this is when Walton told the whole story. The Walton experience. And then the movie came out in 1993. Great movie. Go check it out. As I said in the beginning, the monetary gain, the money from the book, from the, from the movie, adds to the suspicion that the whole thing may have been a hoax. Like I'd mentioned... The idea that Travis and his brother and apparently the the whole family, according to people who knew the family, that they all believed in UFOs and aliens, had all claimed to have seen UFOs over the years, meaning that Travis surely knew about the Betty and Barney Hill incident, right? This is 1975 when this takes place. What was it? When was Benny and Barney Hill? It was like 1961. Something like that. I'm trying to remember. I'm going to look it up. Benny and Barney Hill, 1969. Oh, no. Died 1969. 1961. I was right. Yep. So 1961. And his happened in 1975. So he absolutely knew about that making it easier to add details to his story that would be similar to the already famous case. Then there's the inconclusive lie detector test of Travis himself. The very first lie detector test five days after his disappearance. But what's interesting is that there was a doctor later on, Dr. David Raskin, who looked over the test records from John McCarthy, who originally uh, administered the session with Travis. And Dr. David Raskin said that McCarthy's technique was unacceptable and that his equipment was 30 years out of date. Jesus. Also keep in mind, that the National Enquirer, the National Enquirer newspaper, bankrolled the entire 
UFO investigation by APRO to get exclusive rights to their findings. Motive. So there is a lot of things in this. There's a lot to this. I think what's interesting, and obviously it's from Travis, but the interview with Travis on Jogan didn't go into any, any of the counter evidence. I, I barely, I, I, I'm hesitant to even call it evidence. It's as circumstantial as the case itself. So, I want to believe this. I want to believe this. I was 13 when I first saw the movie. And it was like two years after it came out. And it blew my mind, man. Scared the holy shit out of me. But amazing. What a great movie. And as I've said, the case itself, when you start getting down to the reactions of everyone, the, the crew, how they, res- how they reacted, the time frame in which it was reported, the investigation that took place, the suspicions of murder. It is a real missing persons case where the person came back with a crazy story of being abducted by aliens. Now, again, I think part of this is because he wanted to believe in aliens. And that's why they were aliens. But maybe it wasn't. I, I still, let's think about it from this perspective. You know, he goes into like, oh, you know, lightning strikes in that area and maybe they were collecting those and there's some overgrowth uh, by, uh, of the trees, uh, but that's never been really substantiated, at least from what I can see. Uh, he didn't bring any evidence with him, you know, when he came on the show, which is what absolutely what I would have done, but... It's the reactions. It's the reactions for me. That's what does it. The real missing persons case mixed with the reactions of everyone. That's what really does it for me. His telling of it, his perspective of it at the time was that he was being attacked. That they were trying to, you know, once again... As he even points out, culture isn't very kind to aliens. <laughs> so the idea is they are all bad, want to, you know, want to test on us and experiment on us, you know, steal our livers and our tongues and do whatever, but probe our buttholes. But as he ha- points out on the Jogan podcast, he his perspective is that his fear of the situation change made him believe they were, they were trying to attack him. But all of the actions that he points out later on was not attacking, was not aggressive. They seemed to be trying to calm him down. They seemed to be trying to help him out, repair him. And because of his fear, they weren't able to do so. So they backed out of the room and brought in somebody more, familiar to him, that led him out. That then they put him under and apparently fixed him then. Whatever this pain was that he was having, which could have been from the blast, that he says may have been, and I I find this very plausible, may have been if it was a futuristic craft, a spaceship of some kind, a defensive mechanism by the craft. Or some extension of energy because he's energy and he got too close and so it, you know, like lightning, it met him halfway.
but I'm still reluctant to say aliens because I, I think this is fully capable of being government. Despite his thinking they're aliens, nothing else, nothing else points to it being aliens. A futuristic craft, future humans. Some technology we don't know exists. Even in 1975, I'm not going to claim that they didn't have something then. We, we don't have any fucking idea. And as I've said before, anybody who says that they know is full of shit. Nobody knows. Unless you're read into these classified programs, nobody knows. Nobody. So that there, there was no possible way anybody knows what they had then or what we have now. No way. It seems improbable to, that, that in 1975 there would be a, a goldish glowing craft sitting in a meadow on the top of a mountain. But let's think about this. A remote area in which to study Earth. Future humans that are, what, for whatever reason, low on resources, I don't know, coming to Earth to study things. They decide, oh, this is a, a small area. that There's nobody here. Well, they missed the small crew of seven individuals that happen to be coming down that road at that moment. Maybe. Maybe. Or as we know about government, who is incredibly incompetent and stupid in so many ways, but yet in so many other ways, diabolical. Then maybe they just, due to their poor recon, they got in there and uh, didn't realize that there was a crew of loggers. They zapped him, erased his memory, put in something else, and convinced him it was aliens. And then you have these people, these you know hypnotic regressionists, ufologists, that all back it up. I think Apro being there, the fact that his family believed in UFOs, he believed in UFOs, that's what makes it alien. The incident itself doesn't make it alien. It's all the reactions to that make it alien. That's my opinion. That's my opinion on it. You know, that it's these, it's the want for it to be aliens. So it becomes aliens. And that's it. That's it. But as I always say, I want to know what you think. I want to know. I want to know what you think about Travis Walton and the the Jogan podcast interview and um, all that. What do you think about this? Did you learn something today in this? Uh, did I tell you something you didn't know? Or, or uh, is it all stuff you knew? Or am I missing stuff? Is there stuff I'm missing? Please tell me. Please tell me. I don't want to miss out. And if there's other things I should know. If there's stories that you think I should be on to, if there's news you think I should be on to, if there's things coming down, if, uh, you know, change my mind, please change my mind, please. And uh, if you have experiences, you have stories of your own, <clears throat> you just want to reach out, do so. You can call or text 208-477-1288. Link is in the show notes. You can also email I want to believe 115 at gmail.com, also in the show notes. Or you can join the Tinfoil Militia. Get access to all things UFO know. I'm building a website right now. It's going to be awesome. Going to have it done very, very soon. And of course, thanks to the Tinfoil Militias. Militias. Militia members for episode 107. Casey Armadillo. Michael Ralston. Rihanna Little. The OG supporter. Designer tinfoil hat wearing Aaron Rice. Jesse, great friends and girlfriend of Edwin, who's got a great podcast. Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, and our very own Nathan Boldigon Higby. Thank you all so much. 
Thank you all so very much. I appreciate it. The support, it does mean the world to me. Any donation means the world to me. Any donation, go on there to patreon.com slash UFO no podcast. Become a member of the Tinfoil Militia. Donate today and you get the bonus episodes every single week. Uh, sometimes two this week. There was only one. I got family coming in town. You know, it's the holidays. It's going to be tight, people. It's going to be tight. Speaking of holidays, I hope you're all ready for Christmas. It's right around the corner, y'all. You're out of time. Plus, you get a regular episode. This one comes out on Mondays for the normies. Hello, normies. My general shout-outs to my peoples, the Black Coast Killer Band out of the UK. Wet Wired, their brand. Thanks for the shout-out, guys. Casey Leeski. Ridiculous Patronus One, Your Scented Memoried, Gigi Holland, The Slime King Plays, My Sister Christy, and the whole family, Jesse, Zoe, Emma, thanks for listening. Uh, and of course, remember, go get merch. Become a tinfoilist. Join the cool kids. And remember, well, wrong one. <laughs> remember, stay elevated. Keep your eyes to the skies and watch out for the government. Remember, they're shysty bastards. Bye-bye.